So Ambassador Bremberg, I, we were just at the No Beijing 2022 uh, rally uh, in front of the U.S. Capitol. I still can't believe at this moment that Beijing is having the Olympic Games in 2022 after their, you know, supposed, you know, human rights coming out in 2008 was supposed to solve everything. We saw it went exactly the other direction and the IOC rewarded them a second time. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly uh, distressing for those of us that care about, you know, human rights and human dignity and, and, and care about the Olympics. Uh, to see the organization allow itself to be used yet again as a vehicle for the CCP's propaganda. I mean, this is what we saw that happened in 2008, both from a domestic and an international perspective, as you said. But to see it happening now where, you know, we're, we're no longer in a um, media climate circa 2008. Um, the leadership under, under Xi Jinping has been very clear and very brutal. The, this kind of veneer of reform that, that was present before is gone. Um, we, the, under his leadership, the Chinese Communist Party has uh, reached back to its very totalitarian Maoist roots. Um, and that's why we've seen both the, the genocide happening in Xinjiang for the Uyghurs and other Turkish you know, minorities and Muslims in Western China, and the, you know, um, the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong. I mean, th these are very recent, real, you know, very obvious changes that no one can be in doubt about. Um, and to see the Olympics go forward is just very, very concerning. Well, so the question on everybody's mind, I mean, is how is this possible? Why? Do you have any thoughts on this? I think it's a failure of leadership, a failure of leadership at multiple levels. I mean, most specifically at the IOC. I mean, they have the, the moral responsibility to, ex to exercise better judgment and to show leadership when faced with you know, these grotesque human rights violations happening, they should have stepped forward and you know, um, done something. You know, sought help by other by uh, other member states to help advise them about how they could delay or move or change the venue for Beijing. I mean, there there are lots of roads they could have gone down. But then, separate from the IOC, it's a failure of leadership of, mo of much of the world of the, of the entire international community. You know, the United States, um, our partners in Europe and around the world. You know, freedom and um, democratic governments could have taken much stronger hands in pressuring the IOC to do the right thing. And that didn't happen. So that's how we've landed it up and been, you know, become where we are today. What does the IOC get out of hosting the Olympics in Beijing? Honestly, I don't know. I think it's going to end up being much worse for them than, than not having hosted the games there or even having moved them out of there. I think this is going to be terribly damaging to the you know, brand of the IOC, to the idea that this is an organization that it, in its charter isn't just about sports. Right? It talks about humanism and solidarity as being foundational you know, human rights elements to, to what undergirds the IOC ethos. And no one can think that they actually take that seriously today. Now that they've chosen to host you know, these genocide games in Beijing, um, it's going to be deeply damaging to their you know, image around the world. I just want to comment on this, you know, is, is there any bigger or more stark red line than genocide? No, I, I, I certainly don't think so. Maybe war, outright, you know, war or invasion of another country, but it, it, it's hard to imagine, you know, any kind of worse, as you said, red line. What else does a country need to do uh, in terms of terrible you know, human rights abuses and bad, you know, bad behavior to merit a response? from international organizations like the IOC. And so, you know, when I think of incentives, I always think of money. It's often, often involved. Um, you know, you actually are, have a report out recently that's talking about um, corporate involvement in China, right? I've certainly read quite a bit about how much money is involved for the IOC and, and you know, related organizations, all these sponsors. Um, so how, how does money play into all this? You know, um, when, when it comes to the IOC, I don't know. Um, ha having just returned in the last year to the United States after serving as the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. in Geneva, I had the opportunity to, to see firsthand how both the IOC and other international organizations 
work or try to address themselves in the context of the challenge of China. And quite honestly, the most basic assumption I've made is that it's really just a lack of moral courage and lack of moral leadership. Not that there aren't scenarios where there could be financial inducements or things, I, I believe them, but it's easy just to, for me to have seen firsthand, it's just a lack of moral courage. It's you know, individual people that have no moral fortitude or, and, and are just un, either afraid or unwilling to, to take a stand in doing the right thing. I, I've, I've seen that time and time again. Um, so while of course there could be uh, you know, financial aspects, and of course the IOC had lots of, you know, I'm sure, sunk cost into putting on the, the, the games in Beijing, but I mean, you know, how much is your moral integrity worth? I mean, what, what, how, how much is it w worth to you to maintain the idea that your organization actually stands for solidarity if, if you claim it? I mean, you can't put a price tag on that. And so on the corporate side now, there's huge amounts of money involved, very transparently involved, both for actually broadcasting the, the games and also for you know, all sorts of sponsorships. And you actually, in your new role with the Victims of Communism, um, you've now published this, this report related to this. T tell me about that. So just today, we've re released our new Corporate com Complicity Scorecard, which is a new first-of-its-kind report where we looked at eight major U.S. corporations and examined their business activities in China. The fact that someone is doing business in China is not necessarily a, a, a problem. But we think looking at what are clearly the most troubling aspects of China's human rights violations today, you know, its use of forced labor and the genocide in Xinjiang of, of Uyghurs and other minorities, the aggressive development of you know, AI and surveillance tools used to surveil and you know, clamp down on Chinese people across the entire country, like, like has never been done before, the most kind of you know, Orwellian surveillance state being developed today. And the militarization, you know, you know, direct connections to military activities done by the PLA, we thought these are very clear or should be red lines that you know, no U.S. company would ever want to cross or be engaged in those activities. And I really encourage individuals to check out our website, victimsofcommunism.org, where you can find this new report or follow us on Twitter at VO Communism. But we think it's a really important first step. You know, unfortunately, there are thousands of companies that do business in China. We've looked at these first eight, mostly large major U.S. tech companies. Um, but we want to look at companies across the different industries to see what type of exposure they have to these really you know, troubling areas of you know, the Chinese Communist Party's worst activities. So what gets you an F? Well, we, we looked at um, whether or not they had been had any direct involvement with uh, forced labor or operations in Xinjiang, and that was a kind of red line. You'd automatically get an F. And then the other um, elements were, you know, additive. We we, look, we looked at multiple ele elements in each category, and if you had, you know, no good areas where where you had no activity, or had too many areas where there was troubling activity, that was added up in our report that lowered a, a company's score. And unfortunately, we had so many companies that that failed. Really, our hope is that this will be the beginning of a process where chump companies will actually evaluate themselves and change their behavior. That's really the, the ideal goal, so that the companies we examined, plus all the companies we haven't examined yet, will look at these criteria and say, we're gonna change our practices, change our activities to avoid these troubling areas. But if they don't, the real opportunity I, I see then is it's gotta come to Congress and our policymakers to force that change. We, we just saw at the end of 2021, the passage of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act that puts in place a prohibition on, the, on any importations of products made um, by uh, forced labor or any connection to forced labor through Xinjiang throughout China. That's an important first step. That was critical. But I think we need to see Congress take more action to make clear to companies that you know, direct involvement in the surveillance state of China is going to be is not going to be allowed or direct involvement with the militarization by the PLA with China can't be allowed. So I think we need to see more actions taken to make clear that if companies aren't going to voluntarily choose you know, to do the right thing that our government is going to force them.